This here is Boom Studios Go Go Power Rangers comic, issue number 5. We begin just over 10,000 years ago, for some reason, where Rita's putties are taking on the Briel army, who look like Namekians from the Dragon Ball series. And their high captain looks like the Megazord. I'm saying that because the shape of the sword looks like the power sword, and the horns on the high captain resembles those of the Megazord. It also reminds me of one other thing. The Chinese ripped off Power Rangers by creating a CGI animated series called Shen Shou Jin Gang, which consisted of colourful superheroes based on the original Megazord. See the wacky colours and spirals? Anyway, the Briel army is defeated by an alien called Montar, and the High Captain's helmet is taken to Rita. She says Lord Zed tasked her to conquer a thousand worlds. And yes, Lord Zed is mentioned here already, which does make sense because Rita is supposed to be working under Lord Zed, despite him only being introduced in the second series of the Power Rangers show. Montar is there to speed things along. It's unclear where Montar actually came from, but as he's showing Rita where the Briel castle is, he suddenly gets zapped by Rita's wand, and he's destroyed. She walks away saying she had such high hopes. So this reinforces the idea of the comic book Rita being more evil than the one from the TV show. Now it's arrival day plus 12. The rangers are piloting their dino zords and battling each other to learn more about their zords. By the way, the artist has once again drawn the Megazord's cannons onto the back of the Tyrannosaurus. So I guess this is Boom Studios' way of saying the cannons belong there. The great thing here is that there's further explanation as to how the rangers actually pilot the Zords. Zordon says when the rangers are morphed, they're connected to the Zords at a neurological level. So the controls and capabilities are connected to the rangers' minds. It's this realisation that made Billy deploy the Triceratops horn chains for the very first time. The rangers still have a lot to learn and Zordon says they need to train. The rangers power down for the time being. Kimberly is not too pleased with Zordon's pep talk, thinking it was to tell the rangers to train harder. Trini is hoping the saber-toothed tiger dinosaur has a flamethrower, whilst Jason believes the rangers should keep up with the training. Kimberly thinks the rangers will keel over from exhaustion with school, their jobs at the juice bar, and their ranger duties. The rangers teleport to school, and it turns out it's a week before homecoming. Zack has been asked out by somebody, but she remains anonymous after leaving the invite in Zack's locker. Trini asks Jason if he's going to ask anyone to the homecoming. He says he will, once Rita is defeated. That's a no then. Bulk and Skull then interrupt the group as it turns out Bulk is trying to run for Homecoming King. You can tell by the look of Jason's face he is not amused, and refuses to sign the form. Zack and Trini however go ahead and sign it. Bulk and Skull leave, and they say they have 48 signatures to go before they achieve their 50 signatures goal to be on the ballot. Over to Billy's house, and he's got a poster of Albert Einstein on his wall, which makes sense because he's quite the scientist. But he also has a model of a monster on the wall, a poster seemingly referencing Batman and Robin, and one of Wolverine from X-Men, though here it seems to be Z-Men. Batman references were made in the original TV show, but there was also the Justice League Power Rangers crossover comic, where both teams worked together. So that was fun to see in Billy's room even though it didn't fit his character anymore. Billy was sent a package from Promethea, a preview of some things to look forward to if he gets the internship. His dad originally hoped Billy would be a star quarterback, but he's managed to embrace Billy's love of maths. He also tells him that he has to give this opportunity everything he's got, because this chance won't come again. Well, in the main comic book series, Billy has met Grace Sterling, and she even said she wants to hire him. So we'll have to wait and see how that pans out in the main comic. Now, over to Kimberly and fake Matt. 
It was revealed in the last issue that the real Matt is trapped on the moon, and this one is a putty pretending to be Matt. Kimberly notices Matt behaving differently, and after what the real Matt went through last time, she's willing to skip homecoming this year. She says she doesn't need a stretched limo, or an orchid, and rose corsage, etc. Is this a reference to the Suzy Q film that Amy Jo Johnson left Power Rangers for? In Suzy Q, Amy Jo Johnson's character was dressed up nicely for the formal, before getting killed in an accident. Anyway, fake Matt is up for going to the homecoming, and Kimberly wonders when Matt got so cheesy. Zack, Trini, and Jason then interrupt. Fake Matt continues acting weird, and tells them that the coach has given him the all clear to play against Stone Canyon. Jason says they're animals and that all they do is hurt people and win championships. There was a bit of rivalry between Angel Grove and Stone Canyon in the original TV show, and this was a bit of a funny dig at Aisha, Adam and Rocky, who replaced Trini, Zack and Jason respectively in the TV series. Rita has been observing from the Moon Palace the whole time, and she knows fake Matt is raising suspicions. Finster defended his creation, saying that it's learning human behaviour. However, Rita thinks the more fake Matt and Kimberly are together, the quicker the Rangers will see through the facade. So she goes to the real Matt. She basically wants to know everything about Matt and what he knows. Matt calls Rita Warlock Madonna, in reference to the Cones Madonna War. Rita uses magic to fool Matt into thinking he's talking to Kimberly. With him fooled, Rita asks Matt if he knows any secrets about the group. Matt appears to try and fight it, but Rita's spell is too powerful, and Matt begins to talk. At the youth center, Jason is sparring with fake Matt. Although it looked like Jason was in control whilst training fake Matt, he narrowly avoided getting kicked by him. Jason laughs it off, saying he almost got him. That's because Fake Matt was trying to get him. The two of them are in the locker room afterwards, and Fake Matt tells Jason that Trini likes him. Jason is clearly taken aback, but insists he and Trini are just friends. He says he will talk to Trini about it, but Fake Matt tells him it's best to keep Trini at arm's length, so he doesn't hurt her. This must be one of the secrets the real Matt gave up for Rita to exploit. I can see that causing friction in the team in future issues. Back to Bulk and Skull where a girl named Marlo is telling Bulk not to run for homecoming king. If he does, she will make his life even worse. Even though that threat was real, all Bulk and Skull could say about Marlo was that she smelled good. Back to the Power Rangers who are in the pocket's dimension. Once again, they're in their Dinozords training. It's four versus one as the Rangers try to find Jason. During the search, Kimberly asks if anyone knows a girl, they can set Billy up for the homecoming dance. Billy says there's an MST3K marathon on that night. That's the Mystery Science Theatre 3000, an American comedy TV series. A nice little nod to real life popular culture. So, Billy will be occupied with that. Then, Jason's Tyrannosaurus appears. He takes out Trini and Zack, so only Billy is left. Jason waits for Billy to make a move, but he chooses to surrender instead. Jason then calls off the exercise. They dismount their Zords, and Jason gives the team a telling off. He's not happy Kimberly was playing matchmaker, and he wasn't pleased Billy was paying attention to the smell of the forest like it was a real one. Trini tries to tell Jason they got distracted, but he tells her not to make any excuses for them. He tells them, as he tells his karate class, if one of them fails, they all fail. So, we're at breaking point now, as Jason tells them they were friends before, but now they're teammates. If protecting the team means he has to push every ranger harder, then he's willing to make the sacrifice of no longer being their friend. And that's it for this issue. Only five issues in, and Jason is showing his harsh side as a new leader. He's very different compared to the Jason of the TV series. But the same goes for every other character. I'd like to know what the other Rangers have to say about Jason's leadership in the next issue. 
but I'd also like to know what the Briel army was all about at the start of this issue, as it didn't seem to affect the Ranger's story in any way.